feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did supposed fail to, her. We're supposed to, it was another that. era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Hello and welcome. I'm James Max. You're with Talk TV. On TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. This is Prime Time, bringing you all the stories that matter. On the show tonight, Labour's Iron Lady, Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves, pitches herself as a modern-day Margaret Thatcher. In a speech tonight, we'll be asking... Can Labour be trusted with the economy? Crazy conspiracy theories continue to run rampant about Princess Kate, despite video proof she's recovering well. So what will it take to put to rest once and for all? And as roads across the country reach breaking point due to potholes, we ask, is Britain the worst place in the world to be a driver? Plus, we'll bring you our nightly panel looking at all the other stories making the headlines today with commentator Paul Mason and commentator at the Mail on Sunday, Dan Hodges. This is Primetime. Good evening to you. You may have noticed that the economy isn't in great shape. It's one of the biggest reasons that the next election, frankly, is looking like a foregone conclusion. Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves likely to soar to victory no matter what the government try. Speaking tonight, the Shadow yeah. Chancellor promising economic radicalism on a level of all people with Margaret Thatcher. She'll need to be radical after all. What will she inherit? In the words of a famous note left by the last Labour government, there is no money left. Councils are struggling, roads are crumbling. Public services are creaking. And one of the government's biggest moments in its budget was the abolishing non-DOM tax status, taking billions that the opposition had depended on for, for tax cuts instead. So it adds up to a very ugly picture indeed. But as for the hard choices Labour will be making in office, sometimes it's hard to get answers. Tax and spend or save and rebuild. What exactly are the policies? Let's have a quick listen to our likely next Chancellor. I suggest that the answer to today is an economic approach which recognises how our world has changed. Building growth on strong and secure foundations with active government guided by three imperatives. First, guaranteeing stability. Second, stimulating investment through partnership with business. And third, reform to unlock the contribution of working people and the untapped potential throughout our economy. So what do you make of that? Are you persuaded? And what else can we expect? Well, here in the studio, The Sun's deputy political editor, Ryan Saby, uh, joins me as well as left-wing commentator Paul Mason and Mail on Sunday economist and commentator Dan Hodges. So, look, here we are. We've got, um, arguably, the shadow chancellor, Ryan, she's channelling... Margaret Thatcher. This is something which is absolutely both extraordinary but also kind of inevitable because Labour have got to prove themselves credible with the economy, haven't they? Well, that's right. And that's why you've seen over the past two, three years, Rachel Reeves, ever since she became Shadow Chancellor, um, shaking hands with, I think, every single businessman and uh, business lady in, in, in the city. They just have to be taken serious on, on the economy. And they've gone out and met people to try and win over the city. Um, but what, uh, when it comes to Margaret Thatcher, I think the point she's trying to make, it's like an inflection point. It's, it's a point, as in 1979, when Thatcher came to power, it's a time for change. So there has to be change. And she talks about major reform, whether that comes into the, the planning system. And she just wants to get those big reforms to get the economy growing and productivity up. So you talk about those aspects, but then on the other hand, there are aspects of credibility both of Labour when it comes to power and also when it comes to Rachel Reeves and her thinking. I mean, people keep pointing and saying, yes, but she was an economist at the Bank of England. She, she worked for six years uh, as an economist and an advisor and since 2010 has been an MP, has little or no experience in the world of business and finance. And when it comes to dealing with really getting the credibility of Britain PLC back on the map, she hasn't delivered anything. It's vapid, it's words. Can that really be enough? 
I think the public will have a, a definite choice to make, but I think what she needs to do is to talk about growth and how she's going to do it. And what she hasn't done quite yet, possibly because it's like we're six months out from a general election, is talk about those tax and spending plans. I think what you're going to see from her tonight and as she delivers that speech is very sort of broad brush approach. You're not going to get the finite policy. She's going to get in there and study the, uh, study the, the books and how much money is actually around. So I think she wants to create a big picture of where she's heading and where she wants to take like, a Labour government. Well, we'll certainly get some more views in, uh, from you and indeed the rest of the panel in a moment. However, Labour are trying their change relationship with business. So let's get some of that reaction to the Shadow Chancellor from Crossbench, founder of Cobra Beer, Lord Karen Billamoria. Uh, Lord Billamoria, thank you so much for joining us here on Talk TV. So, Rachel Reeves, she sounds credible. She's channeling her inner Thatcher. But has she got it? I think this is music to my ears and businesses' ears to hear Rachel Reeves giving this very important lecture. I remember when Rishi Sunak gave this lecture when I was president of the CBI, and it sounded very impressive when he gave it, uh, but what has happened since he gave that lecture uh, is that taxes have gone up to the highest level in 70 years. What is reassuring is Labour are not talking about, they're not talking about putting up taxes, uh, they are talking about growth, they are talking about investment, they are talking about an industrial strategy. We don't have an industrial strategy at the moment. So I think this is music to my ears. If they deliver on this, and I, I agree there are no specifics at this moment, it would be great to see the, but to, to relaunch this unit that supposedly exists within the Treasury but is not being made the most of would be great. And I keep reminding Rachel Reeves and Keir Starmer and the Labour Party, the most business-friendly government that I've experienced since I founded Cobra Beer over three decades ago was the Tony Blair, Gordon Brown Labour government, when we had low rates of tax, low rates of income tax, capital gains tax was 18%, entrepreneurs relief up to £10 million, really encouraging enterprise and entrepreneurship and business and investment. What do we have now? Corporation tax from 19% to 25%. Uh, an economy that's not growing, that's been in recession, high debt, low productivity, uh, investment. We used to be a magnet for investment, and, and a gateway into the European Union, uh, that magnetism needs to be brought back in. And if she talks more like this and delivers on this talk and actually walks the talk, it'll be great news for business. Now, it's very interesting that you say walk the talk because, uh, as you said, uh, when you heard Rishi Sunak and he delivered and said all the right things, but as you perhaps also indicate, hasn't exactly delivered for whether it's the public or indeed for business. When it comes to Rachel Reeves, she's talking about uh, stability and investment and reform. But when it comes to investments, as soon as you start uh, indicating that overseas investment isn't welcome or investment in business for tax um, offset isn't necessarily going to be legislated for, it's just hollow words, isn't it? So presumably she's got to make some real measures. And when it comes to uh, election time, she's got to put forward some policies that people are actually going to be able to have some uh, belief in. When it comes to the manifesto, they're going to be, have to be much more specific. I mean, the Conservative government now has reduced national insurance and employees twice in a matter of months. It hasn't had much of an effect because people see that they've done that on the one hand. On the other hand, the tax thresholds have been frozen. So everyone is paying more tax and people know that they're worse off um, and little touches like reducing national insurance by 2p are not going to work. And then the non-dom issue, that is some, trying to steal Labour's thunder. Well, Labour have got to be much, much more adventurous than trying to tinker around. And then the Conservatives saying, we're going to abolish national insurance altogether. Well, where are they going to get the £46 billion to abolish employees' national insurance and employers' national insurance is double that figure at 112 billion pounds. So I think Labour got to have the guts when it comes to election to be specific because what they're saying now sounds good. If they can be more specific, they'll get everyone because everyone wants to change. People have had enough. If you look at the latest happiness index, it's lower than during the pandemic. People are not happy. The cost of living crisis has been very badly. We've been through a tough time. We need a change. That's what the public are saying. Now Labour deliver on that change.
Lord Karen Billamoria, thank you very much indeed for joining us here on Talk TV. So let's turn to our panel. Perhaps, Paul uh, Mason, I can turn to you first. So, look, Rachel Reeves talking a good game. You must be delighted that she's channeling her inner Thatcher. Do you know what? I, I've listened to the speech so far and she hasn't mentioned Thatcher and I don't think she will. Uh, what, what the briefing has been about is the idea that this is as big a turning point as 1979. What Rachel's doing there, she's outlining a, a new model for the economy. And I'll give you an example. People say there's no detail. There's a great detail that, that's uh, coincidentally come out today. Today, the government has nixed a giant solar farm in Norfolk. Norfolk. Uh, it's just basically said after the, uh, the planning authorities allowed it, the government finally just called it in and said no. OK? Rachel Reeves gave, the, is in this speech, she's still on her feet, is giving the clearest possible signal that Labour's changes to the planning regime will presume in favour of solar farms, of pylons, of generating projects. So it's in favour of growth. Yeah, but that's, that's, not, that's not going to fix our economy. If we well, fix I'm, our economy, we've got the highest tax burden in 75 look, years. She should be channelling her inner Thatcher. The, Thatcher the, was a fantastic... You should be asking what would Margaret do to fix our economy, shouldn't we? Well, there's no, she's not going to be putting tax up, is she, overall, because it's the highest burden ever. Well, let's but hope if not. You, if you think about our big problem is not simply that we're not growing and we're flatlining as an economy, we're flatlining when there's a tiny tiny amount of extra potential to go. So the only way of getting out of this trap is you grow the economy. But you say, That's things you, like but bringing say, onshore jobs, bringing onshore energy. That's why we need a planning revolution, and that's what she's promised tonight. Well, you say a planning revolution, but then on the other hand, you say she's not putting up tax. But then one of the first things they keep talking about is putting VAT on private school fees, which I understand ideologically why you might want to do that. But everybody has said you will not raise more tax. Until or unless Labour get off its high horse, very quickly, as soon as they, if, even if they do win the election, unless they understand what Blair did, which was completely change the perception of, of the Labour Party, if they go back to their old tricks, people are going to vote them out the next election. I'm not sure many ordinary people will be shedding tears about that on private schools. It's not about shedding tears, it's about costing money. Dan, let's bring you into this conversation. So, look, is Rachel Reeves saying enough to give us confidence that Labour can finally do something right with the economy on the basis that everybody had confidence in Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, until they completely stuffed it up? They have to take responsibility for the fact that they crashed the banks, crashed the economy and crashed our finances. No, of course she isn't. And, um, I mean, Paul's basically just admitted it by, by highlighting that the big idea in the speech is something about Norfolk solar farms. Um, but we're talking about Rachel Reeves' speech. We could be saying the same about the speeches being given by any of the current Labour front bench, including Keir Starmer himself. I mean, a, a, a Tory minister a, a few weeks ago said to me, you know, in terms of policy, Keir Starmer's uh, all high heels and no knickers. And that is basically where Labour is. There is no substance from Labour on policy. Lord Balamoria said, you know, we'll, we'll have to see some detail in the manifesto. We won't see any detail in the manifesto. And there's a simple reason, which is people like me have been writing for the last couple of years. We have to have more detail from Labour. We have to have more detail. We have to have something from them to tell us how, that, how they're going to run the, the, the country. They've given us precisely zero detail. And they're 25 points ahead in the opinion polls and they're going to win the election by a landslide. But they are going to do that. And that's partly, um, in my view, a whole selection of own goals by the Conservative Party that they've forgotten. And it's maybe the Conservatives who should be looking back to the Thatcher revolution, whether it's, you know, people keep saying, oh, Margaret Thatcher destroyed manufacturing. Well, it was 7.5% higher uh, by the time she left in, in, terms, in real terms compared to when she arrived. Um, we talk about the change of relationship of the unions. We talk about the change of uh, international relationships uh, and, and how we put ourselves on the global stage and how um, the UK put itself at the centre of a financial and a, uh, an economic revolution that enriched the nation to a huge extent. And, and yet Rishi Sunak and his bunch of clowns have, have managed to make every single mistake possible. And as you say correctly, we've got the highest tax burden in 75 years. Um, I mean, if you had to give advice, whether it's to uh, Rishi Sunak, it's probably too late, but if you could, uh, what would you do? Also to Rachel Reeves, you have to. I don't care who you are, you have to reduce the tax burden, don't you? It's, that's not the key to, to growing. It really is not the key to growing. The key to growing is, is, is a business investment. Now, we can do things to taxes. That, 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 for example, there are free ports, there are uh, economic zones that where, where people are uh, exempt from certain taxes. But well, in like the enterprise end, zones as channeling Thatcher. Well, yeah. One of her great yes. successes. I, 
And you see, for example, where Labour is in power, Welsh Labour has gone with the idea of these uh, special, these free ports, the special enterprise zones, and brought, for example, union rights into them. I'll, I'm very pleased to see that Rachel's speech tonight has a big thing about workers' rights, how important it is that workers at work gain security so that they, they, could, they themselves can invest in their own housing, their own future, their own training. This is, this is very opposite to Thatcherism, of course, but it's, for, for people like me as her you know, lifelong Labour supporters, it's great to see that there is no a growth plan that involves the workforce having rights and not having less rights. OK, Ryan, from your perspective, you, you see this growth plan. Everybody talks about growth. Um, Liz Truss handed out of office when she actually talked about it and said that's the key to unlocking it. Maybe uh, she and her then-Chancellor uh, applied it in such a cat handed manner. But then Rachel Reeves underlining and saying, oh, it's even more important that we give even more power to the likes of the OBR, the Office for Budget Responsibility. Uh, we're shackling ourselves back in 1960s, 1970s dogma, aren't we? That means that whatever she does or whatever she says, we are not going to unleash the great power that British, um, the British economy could if she got it right. I think you have got the shackles of the OBR, but I think one thing what Liz Truss did, she, you, know, you need to take the OBR kind of with you. You need to explain how you're going to do things. So if you are going to have a big changes with uh, whether it's childcare, planning um, and create all those things, you can explain how growth comes over a number of years. Liz Truss tried to do everything in five minutes. If Rachel Reeves tries to do that and has a five-year plan or a 10-year plan, that we will see growth. And don't forget, you know, there's a huge, huge untapped resource of the economically inactive 2.8 million people or so that she'll try and tap into and try and get them help and grow the economy. Well, it would be nice to get some people back to work. Uh, Dan, uh, if you had to give some advice, presumably there's no point giving advice to either Rishi Sunak or indeed Jeremy Hunt. It's, it's a lost cause, isn't it? So, uh, Rachel Reeves, uh, we, we, think, we, we pray. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, it's certainly a lost cause for Rishi Sunak and, and Jeremy Hunt. I mean, the advice, as I said, I mean, the advice I've been giving over the last couple of years is we need more detail from Labour. And as I said, that hasn't been forthcoming and it's been a brilliantly successful political strategy for them. The one word of caution I would give to Rachel Reeves is obviously she's deploying, as is Keir Starmer, a classical new Labour uh, playbook of don't be scared of us, you don't have anything to worry about, we basically represent the status quo with just a few tweaks. The problem is, I think, if you asked anybody in the country at the moment if they wanted a retention of the status quo, mm. they'd, tell you, they'd tell you where to go. So I think there is a danger for Labour in, in overplaying the caution uh, at a time when I do think, whilst people may not want, quite want sort of some of the quite radical change that, that, that Paul wants, I do think people do want the idea that there is going to be some sort of change. And, and to use that phrase, things are going to get better. And simply what, what we're hearing from Rachel Reeves today is not really delivering that. Well, I think we'll be able to discuss that more and more over the coming weeks and months. However, we must move on because next on Primetime, the Princess of Wales is pictured for the first time since before Christmas. But is it enough to put the conspiracy theories to bed? Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> 
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching Primetime with me, James Max. Now, next tonight, where is the Princess of Wales? That's the question pretty much everyone has been asking in recent weeks after Kate was last seen in Sandringham over Christmas before un undergoing abdominal surgery last month. Well, today, internet sleuths, who were adamant her disappearance was mysterious, finally got an answer. Pictured for the first time this year at a garden centre in Windsor, she was with her husband, William. But the photo is still not enough for some conspiracy theorists who are still insisting the footage is fake. Unbelievable. Now let's get some detail from Talk TV's royal correspondent, Rupert Bell, joins me now. Rupert, good evening to you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us here on Primetime. So, can we take these pictures as final proof that the Princess of Wales is alive and well? I think we have to. On face value, people have done tests on them, and it all seems to be to suggest that it's William and Kate were out shopping at Windsor Farm Shop after going to see their children play uh, sports at Lambrook School, I assume, on that Saturday afternoon, then they go shopping. Some passerby has filmed it, and it's gone to TNZ, it went to The Sun, and we have to take it completely on face value. But the conspiracy theories afterwards is just now off the scale. And it just shows that ever since even the photoshopping problem on mothers uh, on Mothering Day, when the picture came out from Kate, that there is a bit of a feeding frenzy. And the conspiracy theories, look, it's everywhere on Twitter, not just about the royal family, but these do seem to be now going into a new level. And I think we have to just take it on face value. It's probably not what the Kensington Palace wanted, that it they've had to, you know, it's come out via social media and that someone was standing there filming. But let's be honest, James, we know that everybody who goes out has got their cameras out at every opportunity. And if you suddenly see William and Kate, what are you going to do? You're going to film it. And whether they like it or not, it's just what goes on now in uh, on, a, on a daily basis, wherever you are. Now, you talk about, um, I, I suppose, these conspiracy theories and they've gone into sort of like full and ridiculous gear. But how much of that is going on? Because the palace appears to be operating a press and PR policy that was developed in the 90s, that they have to take responsibility for the fact that they've been slow to react, they haven't read the room, and they're not providing us with the information we need just to quell these ridiculous rumours. Well, yes, and you go back to Diana's death, that that, that was when the... They weren't reading the room. And then we've known, we've seen the films and we've seen all the sort of historical documents about when, what went on then. But it comes actually probably from William wanting to protect his wife's privacy. And that's the problem. Now, out goes that photograph just over 10 days ago, what it was. And then we all look at it. Now we're looking at every single photograph that seems to have come out, whether it's from Kate or about the Queen and 1997, possibly has been... Photoshop. I mean, this is the problem for the palace. And now they've got, and Kensington Palace, they've now got to find a way of restoring trust in the public. 
And it's not easy out in the social media land to do that because everyone wants to jump on a bandwagon, but they haven't necessarily helped themselves. But it comes back to the core thing. Ultimately, William wanted to protect his wife while she goes through her period of recovery. Now, we are seeing her out and about, and she looked fine and healthy, as you would expect. The next stage, will she be back on the road after the Easter holidays, or will we see her at a church service on Easter Sunday? That remains to be seen. But she's now, she's back out there being photographed, albeit surreptitiously by a guy with his phone out. It's a very difficult area for the Kensington Palace to navigate, but it does hark back. You feel it's got a sense of what was happening around Diana's death. And this is in the, clearly not at that level, but the way the royal family were not necessarily reading that room. Just a very quick word, if I may, and you touched on it there. Uh, this picture, which has been identified by the press as, uh, or certainly by, I think, Getty Images, indicating that uh, some uh, touching up, if you like, had been done. Does this mean that the palace are going to have to stop touching up their pictures? Or alternatively, they're going to have to be honest about what they have? Um, I think they've just... I think the first thing they need to do is to... Put the Kensington Palace PR team now they need to get back out there and have all the various picture editors and everyone around the table and start talking to them one-on-one -on -one and actually saying, right, what have we got wrong here? And actually learn from any mistakes they've made that what do we need to do to make sure you tr trust that anything we send out is actually right. Because when you've got even this video filmed by this guy at Windsor Farm Shop that now people are looking and analyzing, then that's hard, you know, that is now the level it's got to. So anything that comes out of the palace now surrounding the children and everything has got to be felt, have trust. Because once the royal family loses the trust of maybe the media and other people involved, then they're on a sticky road. So they need to make sure that they get people back on side. And then once we know when Kate feels comfortable enough to talk about it, then that's fine. But until that stage, They've now got to think, right, how do we make sure this, this doesn't happen again, whatever, whatever the situation is, that people can trust what we're putting out. Rupert Bell, Talk TV's Royal Correspondent. Thank you very much indeed for joining us here on Primetime. Much appreciated. Now, moving on, it was game day for Culture Secretary Lucy Fraser as she unveiled her much-anticipated football governance bill at Leighton Orient earlier aimed at sidelining dodgy owners and properly managing foreign investment, has she done enough to ensure the new legislation is a keeper? Much of the focus has been on plans for a new independent regulator, which it's hoped will give fans more of a say in the running of their favourite clubs. All in all, it's been dubbed a historic day for football, but will, with concerns still voiced, will it be the right reasons or the wrong ones? Well, for the latest on this, I'm joined by The Sun's chief sports reporter, Martin Lipton. Martin, thank you very much indeed for joining us. So, um, great words. Some people saying this is a pivotal moment in football. Is it enough? Will it help? I think the issue here is no one quite knows what's going on. We've, we've now finally, after four years or three years, got a, a draft idea. A lot of people have led down the garden path about what the powers of this regulator were going to be, particularly Everton and Nottingham Forest fans who somehow persuaded themselves that it would stop the Premier League punishing them. That's simply not the case. What it does give you is financial oversight of the English game. So the plan is it will you know, weed out the rogue owners, prevent them getting their hands on clubs. And we've seen what happened at Bury and Derby and Wigan and all these other clubs where the owners have gone bad. Do you think, though, we've gone too far with football in the sense that there's now so much money and so much foreign money and so much uh, money that cannot necessarily be traced to its true owners um, that maybe this is too little too late? I think there has to be some degree of, of, of oversight. That's what's important. But, of course, no fan wants to see their team stop from spending the money they've got. We've heard it with Newcastle fans and Everton fans and and Aston Villa fans just this season alone, and Manchester City fans constantly, and, and Chelsea fans. So people like rules as long as they don't apply to their team, uh, which has not always been the case with football. It was ever thus. Indeed. But I do think that there's, there are some really good parts of this, uh, this idea, this concept, but there are also some huge issues that need to be properly addressed, and are still somewhat opaque. They're not as clear as they should be. OK, so what are the key areas that you have concern about? Well, when will it start? 
Where will it be? What will all the powers be? How much is it going to cost? Who's going to pay for it? They're just a few. OK, so there are just a few. And then, of course, we've got the prospect of a general election. Um, do you think this will get lost if uh, Labour were to come to power? Or do you actually think that they will uh, tighten their grip on uh, the likes of football? My suspicion is that a, a Labour-instituted regulator will be much, have much more teeth than this in iteration of the, of the concept, for obvious reasons, really. Uh, you know, this is a government which talks about, you know, limited control and uh, letting organisations run themselves as far as you can, but just light-touch regulation. Now, I, I'm not sure that will be the case under a, under a Labour regime, and we will know in a few months. The issue, I guess, is whether this gets through the Commons before the election or the election is called early so that it has to be re-put uh, before the, the, the Parliament in the next session, which, again, would allow a, a new government to put in stronger measures, I, I suspect. If it goes through as it stands at the moment... I'm not sure that any government would really feel that it, it was a, you know, a, a priority to alter legislation that's just been passed, when the basic concept has all party support. Well, I guess it's going to be interesting to see how the Football Governance Bill does. Uh, and there's probably more to talk about and more to talk about in terms of takeovers or otherwise. But for now, Martin Lipton, Chief Sports Writer for The Sun, thank you very much indeed for joining us here on Primetime. Now, next, as the UK reaches an all-time pothole high and councils vow to clamp down on harder on drivers, we'll be asking, is the UK the worst place to be a motorist? Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did the fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to have moved on from era. that. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. 
Welcome back. You're watching Primetime with me, James Max. Once dubbed the FT's Jeremy Clarkson. Yes, that's me. As a petrol head, I'd say motorists have endured a bumpy ride recently. Pothole repairs, they may be at an eight-year high, up 43% from the previous year, but they're still everywhere. An annual report from the Asphalt Industry Alliance found that local authorities expect to fix two million potholes in the next financial year. How will cash-strapped councils afford it and pay for it? Well, now, many local authorities will be able to find drivers for offences such as entering yellow boxes, making illegal U-turns, travelling in bus lanes, powers once reserved simply for the police. This begs the question, is the UK the worst place to be a motorist? For more on this, I'm joined by former Top Gear presenter Chris Goffey. Chris, thank you so Hi. much for joining us here on Talk TV in prime time. So, let me ask you... Is it genuinely a bad time to be a motorist here in the UK? It certainly looks that way, doesn't it? We were talking about it um, the other day, and uh, we were in driving in Cuba a few years ago and laughing about having to drive around huge uh, cabins uh, in the, the Soviet-era motorways that had been built in, uh, in Cuba. And... Uh, wasn't this a funny thing to do, to have to almost go into the other carriageway to get round a pothole? Not laughing now, are we? You know, boots on the other foot. And a lot of the surveys of how potholes uh, are, are dealt with in, a, I think, eight other countries, including the US and, you know, Canada, everywhere else, we're, we're at the bottom of that league. When it comes to dealing with things like potholes, I mean, I've even read that some ridiculous discussion about, oh, well, it must be because electric cars are heavier and that's what's causing the damage. No, it's because the government haven't invested, local authorities haven't invested, they haven't seen it as a priority. Uh, they've taken huge amounts of money from the motorists via uh, the tax we pay, on the petrol we buy, on the electricity we buy, uh, on the road tax we pay, all that sort of business, and yet they don't spend it or invest in roads. Or is that me just being cynical and disrespectful of our wonderful local and national councils and government? I don't think it's the entirely the fault of the local councils. Um, uh, I've seen a figure that uh, uh, government spending on roads has gone down by 45% over the last five years. Now, uh, that's something I've just plucked out of uh, having a quick search, but um, th that sounds like an awful lot. They, they, nobody uh, really disputes that local councils really are very cash strapped at the moment um uh, and and they they've just got a huge task to to do they are taking loads and loads of um money off local authorities i was parking in oxford today and paid five pounds 60 for an hour as a meter which i think ah come on chaps you know you're, you're going to stop people um you know visiting the town and uh, and sp the city and spending money there but uh your own experience tells you, you you drive down country roads and it's just, you know, crashing away. And it's causing so much damage to cars. You know, you're, you're breaking coil springs, you're breaking dampers, obviously uh, damaging tyres. And everybody's got alloy wheels nowadays. And you start, put a big chunk out of an alloy wheel rim and, and you're facing a lot of money. And, and also a paperwork nightmare to get your, your money back off the council who haven't fix the pothole in the first place. So we look uh, ahead, perhaps politically speaking. Um, traditionally, perhaps the Conservatives have been the friend of the motorists, except maybe not at the moment. Uh, the prospect of a Labour government, do you think that we're just going to see any government coming into power simply using the motorists as a cash cow, applying more fines at local and national level, um, and uh, perhaps leaving the motorists almost because of the green argument that we're no longer able to drive our cars because it'll damage the environment and polar bears somewhere may uh, find themselves no longer able to find ice to sit on, that that's going to be the excuse used that we're going to be able to use our cars less and be fined more and charged more. I, I, I think personal transport is now such a, uh, an intrinsic part of everyday life. I mean, I live in rural Oxfordshire. How, how the, how am I going to get out to cinema, theatre, you know, shopping, everything else? The public transport doesn't exist, so everybody, you know, really does need their own personal transport, and that's not going to go away. However, you know, much you, you you get into electric cars or you know whatever, I personally, I'm I'm not a great enthusiast for the electric car revolution because I don't like where the raw materials are coming from at the moment, and as you say, they're heavier, uh, and in that way, in, in the cost of fabricating them. 
uh, more expensive than uh, the established in car, uh, um, diesel petrol cars that we have at the moment. And also diesel and petrol cars, you know, over the last 10 years have become so much more reliable. Uh, the bodywork lasts longer. There's no rust uh, as there used to be. The, these cars are going to go on for 30 or 40 years. Well, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. And as somebody who sits in between driving a, 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 a battery electric car on occasion, but then also loving the petrol noise and sound and driving on an open road, I think we're all going to be targeted. It doesn't matter what you drive. Chris Goffey, former Top Gear presenter, thank you very much indeed for joining us here on Talk TV. It's much appreciated. Now, next tonight, it's the condition that's more than just a headache. And for sufferers, it can derail lives and even push them to serious uh, health situations, even suicide. Now, one MP wants to shift the narrative and stop chronic migraine in its tracks. Conservative MP Diana Davison is one of the 10 million people in the UK who suffers from it, having had her first attack in her early 20s. So debilitating as it has since become, she was forced to step down from the Cabinet in September. Now she's secured a debate in, um, in the House of Commons to fight the condition and to campaign for better access to treatment. Joining me down the line is Conservative MP Dana Davison. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Now, as somebody who, um, the more I read about it, the more fortunate I realise I probably am, do not suffer from migraines. Perhaps you can just explain what it's like and how bad it is when you get one of these conditions. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the condition can vary depending on who's experienced it. I, I ran a survey recently and one person said they wouldn't wish migraine on their worst enemy. Um, some people have sporadic attacks. Some people live with this almost day in, day out. But for me, a bad attack means that I have excruciating head pain. Um, I basically can't leave bed. I need the curtains closed. I'm sensitive to lie. Any loud noises send my head banging. I can't concentrate, I get visual disturbance and blurry vision. Um, and given I'm a politician, I struggle to form words sometimes, which is not really ideal in the profession I have. And actually, compared to some people, I'm one of the lucky ones. Some others have it much worse. So why are you campaigning for this now? Mm -hmm. Well, you'll, you'll know, and, and you outlined for your viewers, that I stood down from my role in government as a result of migraine. And since I did that, I've had a real outpouring of support, but also some real kind of harrowing experiences shared from other sufferers. And what I've learned is that there's a real kind of issue when it comes to accessing good quality treatment. There's a postcode lottery in the UK and also some of these top notch new treatments that people are finding really effective are really difficult to access on the NHS. And so working with the Migraine Trust and the National Migraine Centre, we've been getting our heads together to figure out how best we can really improve things. And for me, one of those ways was by raising this in Parliament, using the platform that I'm privileged to have and making sure that ministers know the reality of the situation on the ground for those millions of people experiencing migraine. And tomorrow we've secured this debate and I'm going to be making some recommendations put forward by me and these charities and other experts to really try and improve things in a tangible way. So you mentioned treatments, but what are the sorts of treatments mm -hmm. that people need to access? Mm -hmm. Well, at the moment, a lot of treatments that are prescribed are preventative treatments that were designed for other drugs. And it's sort of been discovered over time that some people have a positive impact on their migraines if they take them. So we're talking about antidepressants. We're talking about epilepsy medication, things like that, that for some people have a positive impact on migraine. However, there are treatments called um, CGRP blockers, which are a pretty new phenomenon, which have been proven across the board to be pretty successful in not only reducing the number of migraine attacks, but also the severity and longevity of those migraine attacks. The problem at the moment is that on the NHS, because of NICE guidelines, they can only be accessed once three other preventative treatments have been tried. And when I say tried, each of those usually requires at least 12 weeks, which means effectively you're delaying accessing the good drugs that are designed for migraine by about nine months. And even then, some trusts don't allow access to CGRP treatments at all. So really, we're in a ridiculous situation where there are these great drugs available that are licensed on the NHS, and yet so many people are unable to access them. 
Jenna Davison, uh, MP, thank you very much indeed for joining us and uh, thank you for uh, taking that to uh, a debate and uh, we wish you well with that. Uh, perhaps Thanks, uh, we're all regretting you standing down from Cabinet, but <laughs> what a mess they're in. You're probably better off out of it. Now, next on Primetime, I'm going to be joined by the Primetime panel where we're going to be going over some of the top stories from the day, including a new summer heat high of nearly 50 degrees, but where on the planet could that be happening and how worried should we be? Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Time now for our primetime panel to dissect some of the other big stories of the day. Joining me in the studio are commentator Paul Mason and commentator from the Mail on Sunday, Dan Hodges. Now, they're hard to get through to, to the best of times, but it's going to get a whole lot worse. HMRC, yes, the Revenue and Customs, they're closing their self-assessment helpline from the 8th of April to the 30th of September, replacing it with a chatbot and online services. No oh, good. People unable to get online will still get assistance from staff during office hours, although it's not immediately clear how it's going to work. The helpline will deal with priority cases for the rest of the year when it reopens. Um, I just find this absolutely staggering that here we are, we now have all got to do our own tax returns. It's increasingly complex. Uh, we've had the tax system go from 2,000 pages of advice to over 8,500. Uh, it's impossible to navigate. We need all the help we can get. And now HMRC, they're forgetting it and going home. I run a small business. And I have to say, in their favour, when it works right, the digital interactions you can have with HMRC are perfect. It's just 
when it goes wrong uh, or when you've gone wrong. And it, it's... It, it, look, I, I, I can't recall ever getting through, to be honest, to, to one of these uh, phone lines. I think once I got through to pay some tiny amount that needed to be paid back, and a very polite lady spent a long time talking to me about this. But, look, there's, if they're going to do this, the digital side's got to be cast iron because people do worry, don't they? People, small business people especially, worry a lot about playing by the rules. Well, they do, HMRC. but also it's simplicity, isn't it, Dan? Which is, you know, we'll all pay our tax. We know we've got to pay tax. If you make the rules complicated, then people will find ways to reduce their tax bills. So make it simple, make it straightforward, and people will do it. Well, I've got to be honest, if, the, if, if the, 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 the way I communicate with HMRC and the way HMRC communicates with me is, is, is reduced in any way, I see that as an absolute positive, to be perfectly honest. Well, no, but I mean, be, being, being serious, I mean, I, I, I agree with you, I don't, un, I, I don't understand it. I mean, you would have thought that one of the areas, we were, you know, talking about it at this earlier, one of the areas where you think the government would want to maximise their efforts is in their ability to get us all to pay the tax we owe them. So I, I and understand mm. and, and more quickly and more efficiently. So this seems to be a rather short-sighted move, but if it means it, it, I get to take a bit longer paying them the tax I owe them, then fair when, when, Look, when chatbots work, it's often when a company's trying to sell you something more. So I, you, it's got to delight you. You've got to go, oh, well, yeah, I didn't realise that. That would be brilliant if I got that as well. But HMRC is not that experienced. People, as you say, they want as little contact as possible. And it's off. It's really, it's really kind of, it can be life-changing for small businesses if they get it wrong. So they've got to... I, I'm not sure a chatbot is going to be the thing that I want to... I want to talk to you. I have can't to say necessarily how... vent to a chatbot. No, so you haven't. shouldn't vent to the call centre. No, because they're no, just of workers. Not, but I no. have to say, however sophisticated the HMRC chatbox is, I, I, I doubt it's going to be del yeah, I'm, delightful. Yeah, I've got my doubts as well there. <laughs> I, I think we, we, there's a lot of doubt here. Talking of doubt, let's turn our attention to this nation, Britain. We're set to face extreme weather as climate change takes hold. Scientists are now warning, or is it uh, catastrophizing, of 46 degrees summer days and supercell storms, they say. Is it because we haven't listened to their previous warnings, so they've now got to make it even hotter, even more violent? Should we start preparing for this now, or is it an overestimation? I, you know what? The, my problem with the climate discussion is that we are now being forced to believe that things are going to get so terrible and all of the things that we do, it's being politically motivated. We're not having any common sense when it comes to dealing. We know the climate is changing. We know that if the population has gone from 2.8 billion in 1970 to nearly 8 billion today, of course the climate is going to change and there are things that we can do and things that we should do. But this kind of nonsense is going to put people off. I'm not sure it's nonsense. I'm not... Because everybody knows that... The way systems fail, I mean, if you think, even think about cars, you know, the way a system fails is it goes right for a long time and then suddenly kaput. There's nothing can move it. And I think w what we've seen, you know, we've seen in Britain, you know, these, these wildfires, um, wildfires in Britain that burn down council houses that were only grass fires. Why? Because we suddenly, all our emergency services and our fire break systems, couldn't cope with a sudden change. Now, I don't want to frighten people. I want to rouse people to do stuff about it. I think that's the best thing to do. So what I want to know from these, these scientists is, all right, what can we do? What can I do to my house? I've been up on the roof today. What can I do in, in, in case one of these supercell tornadoes hits it? I don't think it helps when you've got local councils saying, oh, yes, we must reduce speed limits from 30 miles an hour to 20 because that'll help the climate. Dan, is this over-catastrophizing or do you think it is actually well, we'll, sensible? We'll see, won't we? But, I mean, I, I, or I think... maybe we won't oh, we'll maybe we won't. out. Um, it, it, we, we'll <laughs> find out the hard way. But, no, I mean, I think, obviously, in general, there, there is obviously a, a serious issue in relation to the environment. My, my concern, and I've written about this a few times, my concern is what are the policy prescriptions that are going to be put in place to try and mitigate against this? Because it seems to me every time politicians reach for a, a, a policy lever to deal with climate change, it's invariably a policy lever that, that, that impacts on those the least able to afford it. Or alternatively, it's ideologically driven that doesn't necessarily achieve those aims. However, we must press on because three Damien Hirst sculptures that have toured some of the world's best galleries have been falsely dated to the 1990s when actually they were made in 2017. 
Mm. The works of preserved animals in formaldehyde were billed as work from Hearst's Turner Prize winning period. However, they're actually made by staff members decades later. Hearst Company, Science Limited, says the date that the artist assigns to his formaldehyde works represents the date of conception. <laughs> wow. Um, I mean, this is just another fabrication. I mean, he could work for the royal family putting out pictures, couldn't he? You know what I say? Fair play to him, you know, if he can get find people stupid enough to buy <laughs> to buy these things. <laughs> and good luck to them, Paul, man. Paul, I mean, are you concerned? Good luck to him. Are you concerned by this? In the 20th century, there was an artist uh, who, who signed a urinal and said, because I've signed it, it's art. I, I, it reminded me of that. Because I conceived these things but didn't make them, uh, I can now backdate them. And, of course, what, that must have affected the price. Well, it must have been one of his original works. You know, that surely there's a... You know, there's a there's a quick case to be answered here about about the price of those those works well, when they went on to the, the market. There is indeed talking of prices of things. Let's just squeeze in a quick story about the luxury car makers Bentley. They've posted profits that have topped five hundred million pounds. Uh, it's not because they've sold more cars. It's because it's uh, they've been selling personalised luxury cars. The super rich have been requesting extravagant upgrades that bump up the already eye-watering price of your Bentley. All right, for some perhaps. Um, would you have a Bentley? Would you get it customised? Or have you got three in the garage already? I, I'm a, a humble Audi driver. And you know what? I've never seen a Bentley on the road. I've seen Rolls Royces and the great rivalry between the two marks, but you don't see many Bentleys, even here in central London. Where well, we go to that footballer's car park. Dan, would you have one? Uh, no, I'll, I'll stick with my Mini, but this is exactly what I was talking about. We did the, we did the item two, two items ago about global warming, and here we have all these rich people in their Bentleys. Oh, come on, love the Bentleys. Meanwhile, Paul and Dan, thank you very much indeed. Now, Mike Graham is up next. What's on the show tonight, Mike? Well, we haven't got any lefties on the show for a start, because, I mean, those people you've got there, you know, absolutely disgraceful, isn't it? The amount of money that people who buy Bentleys put into the economy uh, and they manage to keep the place afloat is extraordinary. I see Bentleys everywhere I go. Maybe I'm just not in the same neck of the woods as Paul. But there we are. We're going to do the green agenda, because I'm going to be explaining just how many people are getting how much money for being green. And it's not the public, it's not the working man and woman, it's all of those millionaires that the Green Brigade protects. We're going for it. There we go. That's all coming up with Mike Graham. Thank you very much indeed. That's all we've got time for tonight. I'll be back on prime time tomorrow and for early breakfast at 5 a.m. So do join me then. The Independent Republic of Mike Graham is next. Good night. Today on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. I mean, there's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such as the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. Said they couldn't back the party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs>
for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on 